Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuhu. This afternoon marks the fifth day of our international virtual uh, short-term forum uh, between Cape Comarin Trust, India and Mindanao State University, Sulu, Philippines. Okay, so this time we will be having uh, two lecturers, one from uh, the country of Canada and the other one is from India. So our first lecturer is from Canada. So let me introduce him. Uh, is Doctor is the first lecturer from Canada around? Hello, Doc Hello Dr. Magna. Okay. I'm here. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Doc. Okay, so our first lecturer for this afternoon is a licensed teacher in the Philippines before moving to Canada in 2008, 2008. He also has long years of experience in customer service, marketing, management in fast food, uh, in fast food restaurant industry for more than 20 years. He is now a professional speaker paid moderator and facilitator and best-selling author. He is a distinguished Toastmaster. Wow! The highest designation in Toastmasters International, the world's biggest organization of communication, leadership, and public speaking. He is a club mentor and a club coach in his Toastmasters organization. He also has his own coaching and mentoring program called the Confidently Speaking Institute. He also teaches communication and public speaking in universities in Canada. If he is not speaking or doing lectures, he works at Alberta Health Services in the dietary department of one of the hospital in his community. Without much ado, Please help me welcome Mr. Von Eric Tando. Sir, Thank you, you may now take the floor. Thank you very much. Dr. Ra, can you see my slides? Yes, it's it's clear already. It's clear already, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ra. So first, uh, I would like to say thank you for inviting me here and also thank you to my dear friend, Dr. Basud Viva oh, from India. So thank you very much for having me. I will say good afternoon, Mindanao State University and good morning from Alberta, Canada. By the way, I'm in Alberta, so it's 12.35 past midnight here. So today, I was given the topic about the role of communication in teaching, learning, and research. But for now, I would like to say, say it loud, say it proud, because today we're going to make an impact and discover the key or the keys to speaking confidently. So that is in teaching, that is also in learning. We have here a program schedule. So we started June the 20th, and I believe this is the fifth day. So today is June the 24th. So again, good afternoon. In Philippine Standard Time, it's 2.30 in your country. Thank you, and I would like to recognize Mindanao State University, Sulu, Philippines in collaboration with the Cave Cameroon Trust India for having me here. I would like also to acknowledge the other speaker, Dr. Kashimira. Did I pronounce it right? Thank you very much. And let's start the presentation. By the way, my presentation will based on my book titled Say It Loud, Say It Proud. So when I say, say it loud, say it proud, it because I always believe in communication. There
we will go going to discover the keys to speaking confidently. And I would like to acknowledge Mindanao State University in collaboration with the CAFE Comorin Trust in India. Also, again, I would like to acknowledge another presenter, another speaker in today's presentation. I'm going to lay down the objectives again. Number one, we will going to discover the keys to speaking confidently. Number two, what is the role of communication in teaching? Number three, learn the import importance of feedback and research. And lastly, we need to understand more what is communication. Okay, so those are the objectives in this presentation. All right. Speak to those who have time to listen to you and listen to those who are willing to speak to you. I love this one. When we speak, we should have the courage and confidence to speak our truth and also to speak our mind. When we write, of course, we have that conviction in our writing, particularly in our research. So what is effective communication? Okay. For me, communication is, you need to be understood to get a clear response. So by the way, can one of you see what's in my PPT right now? Can you see what's the message or what's the, what's the picture all about? Can someone tell me what's in my message? Picture, what's the picture all about in my PPT? So that I will, I will need to know. Okay, clear already. The PPT shows the communication, the figure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's very awesome. Thank you very much for, for that. So in communication, we have the sender, we have the receiver, and we have the message. Now, if we are not clear in our message, then certainly the receiver will not going to understand what we're trying to convey. Okay, so the message is your medium. So let's say, example, you are conveying a pizza, but the receiver understood it like a donut then clearly there's no effective communication there. So I always believe in communication. You need to be understood to get a clear response. Same with true when you are in teaching or you're writing your research. Communication, by the way, can be verbal and nonverbal. Right. So it's the message, how you convey that message to the receiver. Because if the message is not clear, whatever in your mind, and then you use it through talking, through speaking, and then the way you convey is not clear, then the receiver will give you wrong feedback. So simple. In communication, be simple as much as possible. Because our primary purpose here in communication is to be understood. I'll try to give you an example. So here in Canada, I always try to order my food in drive through Now I challenge myself. I always challenge myself saying, this person should get my order at one time. So I don't wanna hear something like, come again, sorry, what was that? Because I challenge myself. 
So let's say when I ordered one cheeseburger and then the drive through person will say, oh, one cheeseburger, then I got my goal, right? There's a clear communication. And later on, we will going to discuss why our communication is not clear. Now, again, I'm going to relate this into presentation, public speaking, writing, or how you organize your thought. Okay, so effective communication, simple is you need to be understood to get a clear response. Okay, moving on. Being able to communicate well is one of the important life skills. In your interview, so that you will get the job that you want. Okay. In your teaching, when you're a teacher, you're a professor. Okay. You need to be understand clearly. And communication is about sharing information, by the way, with one or more persons. The truth is, we are all public speakers. Because public speaking is like you're talking to someone. The notion of public speaking is like this, right? We think that public speaking is actually talking in front of 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 people. No. The moment that you put yourself out there and you start talking, then that is what it meant by public speaking. And when we say public speaking, your aim is to be understood. Have you heard about the saying, why do I hear you, but I did not understand? So always, always remember. Communication is not a soft skill, by the way. Okay. It's an important skill. The moment that we put that goal to ourselves, I should be understood. Okay. Unless you're talking to someone who is deaf or you can't hear you clearly, then there's a problem with that. But again, challenge yourself. And communication is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing learning cycle. The cycle, you need to learn. Now, right now, while I'm talking, I'm challenging myself. Are my audience are able to understand me? Moving on, I know you're very familiar with this quote by Stephen Covey, and in men mentioned, the biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand. We listen to reply. And what is listening, by the way, and this is from Epictetus, and he said, we have two ears in one mouth, so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. Okay. The other responsibility of the receiver is also listen carefully. And when we say listen carefully, we listen to understand, not we listen to reply. Have you noticed that? Like in a group of conversation, one person is talking, and then another person is speaking to without waiting for the other person if he or she's done speaking, right? So listening is actually without judging. So that's the problem in communication. But based on my experience, actually, one problem is we keep on listening without thinking if the person in front of us actually understands us or actually focusing on what we're saying. 
So you need to be very aware too, right? Okay, moving on. This is what I really wanted to focus all about. It's the organization. Now, if you're doing your research, you need to do organization as well. So we're going to tackle here how to make an outline, how you capture your audience when you are presenting or you are teaching. Okay, So make an outline, just like in research, you have an outline. Just like in speaking, you have also an outline. So in speaking, regardless of how many minutes or hours you speak, you always have these three basic components of public speaking or presentation per se. Okay, number one, you need to develop that opening. So opening refers to your introduction to your subject. And then the body of your message. So let's say you're talking about communication, then that's the body of your message. And then lastly, we will go into transition to closing. And when we see closing, that is the conclusion of your topic. So same with true with your research. Same with true with your writing. Or let's say you write a column, or let's say you write a book. There's always, always the opening, the body, and the conclusion. And that's very important. If you're well organized, then communication is very clear and smooth. Okay. Now, most of us are have this anxiety or let's say we have this fear in public speaking. By the way, when I say public speaking, I'm also referring to presentation. Let's say you're presenting to a group of students, you're doing a lecture, you're doing a training, or you're teaching full of students in one classroom. Now, I always keep hearing, I'm really bad at public speaking. Well, here are some tips so that it will help you in your presentation, okay? It's not your personality. It's your presentation. And here are five tips to master your speech. And again, this is very important in teaching and learning. Okay, number one, you need to memorize your introduction and conclusion. So if they invited you to have a lecture, you should have your introduction ready and you have your conclusion ready and you can memorize it. And then number two, eliminate anything that doesn't clearly support your purpose. Okay, so you have to stick to your topic. Another technique when you do your presentation or let's say you're going to teach is record yourself and practice in front of real people. Real people that includes your friends, your family, and that's what I do. Have you experienced practicing in front of your friends or your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your siblings? If not, then start doing it, okay? So practice, practice is very important before you put yourself out there. Next, don't drown your audience in too many data or data, okay? Too much figures, numbers, okay? People want more experience and stories. And lastly, when you think you're bad at public speaking, it's because you think about yourself. Think of your audience. The reason why we are having this anxiety of, having, of public speaking is because 
we are always thinking negative of what the people will say. So I hope these five tips in presentation and teaching will help you to eliminate or reduce that anxiety in public speaking and presentation. Okay, so again, I'm going to uh, mention again, memorize your introduction and conclusion, eliminate anything that doesn't clearly support your purpose, record yourself, and this is very important. Now, if you can't record yourself, you can still practice in the conventional way in front of the mirror, okay? The only advantage why you need to record yourself is you will be able to watch yourself. Unlike in front of the mirror, you can't go back. So in recording yourself in your cell phone, then you can play all over again and that's where you will see your mistake and very important don't drown your audience with too many data and lastly it's not about you okay moving on no words what does it mean by no words our body speaks too, okay? So when we say no words, this is the nonverbal cue, okay? Your eye contact, your facial expression, your movement with purpose, your gestures. Now, if you are presenting in an in-person, you need to own the stage. And what does it mean by own the stage? Own the stage is having that confidence. That stage is yours. So that is meant by no words. No words simply means the nonverbal cue of your presentation. Okay. And you know, our words is only 7%. And the rest, 93%. Your voice, your hand gestures, and everything, that's 93% in total. So that means to say, your lecture, lecture is only 7%. Because your audience will observe you, will judge you, on how you convey your words, on how you use your hand gestures, your eye contact, your facial expressions. So I suggest when you present, particularly as a teacher, you need to move with purpose, okay? So if you can see the picture around here, this is our, these are the things that we need to eliminate, okay? So putting your arms together or clasping your arms together, okay? So the reason behind here, the rationale behind here is if you're putting a barrier, as if you're putting a wall between you and your audience. So as much as possible, eliminate these gestures, okay? So have your hands relax in your side or use your hands for hand gesture okay i hope that's very clear filler words okay one volunteer what is filler words have you heard about filler words Okay, uh, any volunteer, someone? Have you heard the word pillar words before? Or put it in the chat? Anybody, doctora, can you help me? Can you ask someone there if they know filler words or no? 
Uh, pardon, sir, if you could please repeat the last sentence once again. Yeah, what is filler words? Anybody who knows about filler words? Yes, sir. Filler words are words that we use when we are thinking, like uh, um, like that. Very good. Very good. So I hope everyone here uh hear about Thank what you, Dr. Uh -huh. yeah Thank so you that's so much your words. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that not so important word when we speak like um yeah so you know like ah okay as much as possible eliminate those filler words. Are filler words bad? Yes, if it's too much. Okay, I'll give you an example. My name uh, is Bon Eric Kandok. Uh, I am teaching uh, communication. Uh, Sir Bon? Like, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Neri Jalani would like to also share about uh, what is filler words. Yes, please. Yes, okay, please go you. ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Professor Jelani from MSU. Uh, with regards to filler words, these are words or sounds or some phrases that we insert in our conversation. Like when you say, you know, uh, so we fill in words that are not part of the conversation. Is that right, sir? You're very right, Professor, Doctor. Thank you very much for that. So not so okay. important. Thank you. Thank you. Not so important. And the moment that we incorporate those not important words in our conversation, in our presentation, then, okay, number one, it might affect your credibility as a presenter, as a teacher, because it seems that you're thinking, thinking of the next word you're going to say. Now, to avoid that, because you're thinking of what you're going to say, I recommend the use of pause or pauses. That is what we we'll call the power pause. So example is like what I'm saying, my name is uh, Bon Eric Tandok. Uh, I live in uh, Canada, uh, in the Philippines. I'm a teacher. Uh, okay. So do you think that's a clear communication? No. The audience will recognize those filler words. They might not know that's a filler words that that will interfere, and you will not give a clear communication. As what Dr. Jelena said not important words in your conversation now think about yourself if you are in a presentation using too much filler words so how are we going to avoid filler words stop instead of telling those words like you know lie ah uh, okay in that way you will project yourself with conviction with credibility in that you know your subject very well and that's right the reason why we have pillar words is because we're thinking but it takes a lot of practice to eliminate pillar words in my organization in toastmasters at the end of the meeting we have this report to someone who used the Filler words with many times. Okay. If you don't have a filler words, that means you're doing very great. You're doing very well. So if there's one thing that I'm going to leave to all of you is this one. Avoid filler words. We tend to have the filler words if we speak in another language. Let's say from your native dialect and speaking Polifino, or from, let's say, from your native dialect speaking in English, right? We have lots of filler words, is because we tend to think 
But rather than thinking of what's the next word you're going to say, I suggest have the power of pause. Okay, I hope that's very clear. Let's move to another ideas, okay? Developing your idea into a speech, developing your idea into research. We all have ideas, but the moment that those idea will not develop into a presentation, will not develop into writing, will not develop into research, then that's only ideas. So again, just like what I said, the three basic components in presentation, public speaking, when you outline your presentation, your speech, your writing, you know, always remember the three main components of speech. That is the opening, the body, the conclusion. Okay, So develop those ideas. Put that into writing. Put that into presentation. Okay, you may have an idea, but if there's no action, then that remains an idea. So put that into action. Ideas to reality, okay, or let's say abstract to reality. So put that idea. Okay, moving on. Diversifying vocals. Now, we discuss in communication that might affect your presentation, your teaching, particularly when you present your research, right? Aside from filler words, vocals. You need to have a di diversified vocals, and that includes your volume, your pitch, your rate, and then the quality. So let's tackle volume first, right? right? In communication, it is not clear if your volume is not loud enough to be heard. And how about your pitch? Do you have a high pitch? And this is important too, by the way, the rate, how fast or how slow you speak. So even if you have a very good research and then you present that, Let's say you have a very good thesis, okay? And you present that. You speak too fast, they will not understand you. You speak too slow, then the audience will get bored. So I will say, not too fast, not too slow. And how about the quality of your voice? Is it natural? Are you confident? it will ruin your presentation if you are not confident. Now, what will be the number one solution to all of this? Of course, practice. That's the importance of rehearsal. So for those students, if you have students here, if you're going to present your research, then make sure to rehearse. Okay. So again, diversifying vocals, think of your volume. Think of your pitch, the rate, and the, the quality of your voice. Okay, moving on. I would like to focus on evaluation because as a teacher and a student, we are always being evaluated. Okay. So what is effective evaluation? So your evaluation will come from your audience. Okay. They will evaluate us based on this book, Say It Loud, Say It Proud. They will evaluate us in how we look. Are, are you shy? Do you dress well? And how the speaker sounds? That's why... I discussed the importance of diversifying vocals because you will be evaluated in how you sound. And of course, a good writer is a good organizer. So when you present your 
research, how do you organize your material? Okay. So to be able to get a better evaluation, I suggest you should have a mentor or you should have a coach guiding you in your presentation. Now, if you don't have a mentor, it's very easy. Okay, approach people whom you respect, maybe your teacher, your professor, and hey, doctor, can you be a mentor? Can you be my mentor? If that person said yes, then you're lucky. If no, he said, find another people that will going to mentor you. Keep looking. Mentors are everywhere. The truth is, if a person really wanted you to win, he will help you win. Remember that. So always find a mentor. Mentor in how you write, how you speak. Okay. So that's evaluations. Let's go. Now. As part of our evaluation, I would like to give a little emphasis on the so-called feedback sandwich. So this is actually we do in Toastmasters and also in giving feedback to our employees is the so-called feedback sandwich. So in feedback sandwich, there are three things that you should consider. Number one is the something positive to warm up the discussion. So let's say point something positive, that one thing that you like in the presentation. And then in the middle part is the feedback you actually wanted to give. And then later on, wrap it up with something else positive to soften the real feedback. So imagine the sandwich, okay? There's top portion and then the middle portion and then another portion. So the two portion is like the pan or the bread or something like the sandwich and then whatever the middle part that is the ketchup the meat the patty the lettuce and everything that represents the feedback you actually wanted to give so my point here is if you're a researcher you're a teacher you're a speaker a presenter you should be ready on taking feedback because the moment that you put yourself out there, you're being evaluated. So don't take it personally. Gather all the positive and the not so good feedback because those feedback will help you improve. Okay. Okay, moving on. And that is evaluation. That's why in my topic today, I would like to emphasize evaluations because if you don't want to receive feedback, you don't like opinion, then no matter how good you are, no matter how good researcher you are, if you don't listen to evaluations, then we will not improve. Okay, there you go. Let's go to necessary practice. I mentioned this, the importance of rehearsals a while ago. So when you present your topic, then you need to prepare yourself. So you need to practice. Practicing your speech, your presentation, okay? And when you present your talk to your audience, the old saying says, practice makes perfect. Well, rather than achieving perfection, I'd rather achieve or aim for progress. Progress, okay? Because when you're perfect, then there's no progress anymore. But progress, okay? let's say 1% progress every day, count that in one year. So, it's nice to have a progress. So keep practicing. To remember what I said before, record yourself. 
that's where you're going to see the mistake that's where you're going to improve yourself or probably practice in front of your friends okay if you don't have any question about necessary practice let's go to this one i always love this 5p proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments preparation is the key no matter what you do in life so always remember this five piece proper preparation pre prevents presentation for the comments okay in your lecture when you present your research you need this to remember okay moving on tell your story i tried to incorporate a little story a while ago and don't drown your audience with too much information in data so telling your story when you tell your story you are not just a speaker you're a messenger of your presentation because using a storytelling will make a greater impact to your presentation Okay, so always tell a story, share your experience. We have lots of experience to tell and our story is our own. That makes you unique. No one can tell your story except you. And how will it impact your, your presentation? What's the role of your story to your research, to your presentation, to your teaching? So I have here the role of communication in research. So let's say you will going to present your research, okay? So increasing the closeness between the day-to-day -day problem encountered by practitioners and specific settings in the theories used to explain and resolve the problem. So that's the role of communication to your research. Another rule is providing comprehensive coverage about your research. Okay, You also provide your research that's reliable and high in quality. Telling your story is an important aspect of your communication. And that is the role of communication to your research, to your presentation. You're giving an impact, okay? So in presentation alone, don't just show percentage. Don't just show fractions. You should be able to tell the story behind that research. And because of that, the story that you relate to your audience, that is the message. next one is i would like again to tell about what epictetus in your presentation in your teaching learn the meaning of what you say and then speak you need to understand the meaning of what you wanna convey and then speak it And then, regardless of which language you speak in, you need to be what? We mentioned this one. Regardless of which language you speak in, you need to be confident. And this is the essential aspect of communication. And this is the role of communication to teaching and learning. You need to be confident. C stands for communication. O stands for organization, how you organize your thought, how you organize your research, how you organize your presentation. No words simply means the numberable cues, your hand gesture, your eye contact, your facial expression. Okay? Don't be too serious. You need to smile too. 
pillar words. I hope you, many of you here understand what's a pillar words, but I would like to remind you, eliminate pillar words. That distract your audience and that's affect your credibility. And also it seems that you don't know what you're really trying to convey. So filler words, avoiding filler words. Ideas, okay, convert that ideas into writing, to research. That's why before we have the lesson plan, right? That's idea. Now that lesson plan, put it into action. That is how you teach. Now, diversifying vocals. How's your vocals? Do you, are you monotone? Do you have a variation of tone? Okay. So let's say you're telling a story about a happy experience, then your voice should be happy. Now, if you're telling a sad story, then your voice should not be happy, right? So that is diversifying vocals. Now, evaluations. This is very important. You need to accept feedback. So by the way, evaluations is judgment, feedback, opinion, right? So you need to accept any feedback and learn from it. Don't take it personally, okay? In the Philippines, we call it balat sibuyas, skin onion, right? And then that stop us from presenting. That stop us to be a teacher. That stop us to be a public speaker. It's because we don't accept feedback. We don't accept evaluations. Now, moving on, necessary practice. Always do rehearsal. I remember what Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant of National Basketball Association said. If you see me doing the one thing, and you think I'm doing it with ease and comfort, it's because I did it a thousand times. And when he said, I did it a thousand times, it's because he keeps on practicing. When you keep on practicing, that's where you find the so-called confidence in communication. Now, lastly, is tell your story. Put your story in your presentation. And audience like story, remember that. They like story rather than numbers or data or too much information. So tell your story because your story is your message to your audience. And that makes you unique when you tell your story. It's because no other person will tell your story but you alone. So always remember, this is the role of communication. The role of communication in research, effective teaching, effective learning is confidence. And that is my message today. Confident in your writing, in your speaking. I will conclude my presentation and feel free to reach me out in my Facebook. I'm also in LinkedIn, I'm in Instagram. You can email me to confidently speaking institute at gmail.com. You can also visit my website, www.bonericandok.com. So that's my simple story. And I'm very passionate of sharing my knowledge about communication and that leads to writing a book a book about say it loud and say it proud thank you very much again and if there's any question i'm going to entertain i think we still have a few minutes any question okay thank you uh, mr speaker uh, Mr. Von Eric Tandok for a wonderful presentation. It was really an awesome presentation. You really showed connection with the audience and you show passion with your presentation. And we hope uh, to look forward for our future uh, engagement. And of course, 
we want to hear you speak again uh, in a form of uh, presentation like this. So from the audience or from the participants, uh, dear professors, uh, you may now have your question or you can have or you can raise your uh, 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 query or or question regarding the topic or presentation of our uh, beloved guest speaker this afternoon, Mr. Tandok. Thank you, Dr. Magna. Let's connect on Facebook. <laughs> okay, any question? Um, there is raising a hand. So from uh, Professor Neri Jalani again from MSU Sulu, you are recognized, sir. Hello again. Hello, Hello sir, sir Bon Eric. Uh, I'd just like to add some some things that we have done in our classroom with regards to uh, practicing how to practice to become good speakers. So the usual thing we ask our students is to practice before a mirror so that they will see themselves, uh, their their facial expressions, their hand gestures, their movements, so they would uh, practice before a mirror so that they will see their full person as they speak. Secondly, with regards to the volume of uh, the voice, we always ask them that you practice speaking and you ask the last person in the last row if they could hear you well. And that should be the volume that they would adopt. And as to, yes, as to, uh, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm using filler words. <laughs> As to the confidence of the speaker, I will tell them to imagine that they are speaking in front of uh, trees, people becoming trees so that they will have developed uh, confidence in themselves. So these are the things that we ask students to do in order to be good speakers. Thank you. Very well said, sir. Thank you very much for sharing those. So I hope uh, everyone is listening to what uh, Professor Zimmer, how do you pronounce your name, sir? Zimmer? Zimmer, nice, nice one. Okay, so thank you for sharing. Yes, the mirror. I still use Prof that one actually. Professor Mary Jelani, sir. Mary Jelani, okay. Jalani. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, the mirror, I still use that one until now. It's accessible. Even if I'm in a toilet or washroom, we call it washroom here, I still practice. And as what I mentioned about Kobe Bryant, he keeps on practicing. Right? The word class athlete, they practice. A ballet dancer practices hours a day. Right. Yes. Hey, uh, I think Professor Dinesh Kumar. Uh, sir, very good afternoon. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, my question is very simple but effective. Uh, how to be a good communicator? Yeah, or what needs to be a good communicator? Thank you for asking, sir, that question. How to be a good communicator? I always tell this to everyone. Be yourself. If you're being yourself, then that way you will convey the message you want to tell to everyone. You will tell your story to the world just because being you alone is enough. Just be yourself. Okay? And always... In public speaking and presentation, it's not all about us. It's about the audience. So we cater to the needs of the audience. Right? It's not about you. The you here in being you is just being yourself. The rest is up to the audience. That's why when we speak in a particular situation, we need to know who are the audience. 
my friend, Dr. Basudiva, I asked her in Facebook Messenger, who are the audience? I need to know who are the audience, right? Know your audience because you cater to their needs. And that is uh, one aspect to become a good presenter, good communicator. It's because as a presenter in public speaking, you think of your audience and not thinking about yourself. I hope I answered your question, Professor Dinesh Kumar. But yes, it's the audience that is very important. So there are some factors in public speaking. Number one is feedback. Number two is your message. Another one is your audience. And for me, audience is the number one. Your message is your presentation. Of course, it's very easy to correlate the topic. As long as you know the topic, you know the theme, then you can say your presentation, relate your presentation. But the audience is the most important aspect in presentation and communication. And that is the good communicator. Thank you, Professor Dinesh Kumar. Dr. Magna, do we still have questions? Okay. Um, anyone from the audience to give or to share ideas regarding communication? Or you can also ask our guest speaker this afternoon mr vaughn uh what is all uh, what is about communication i think uh there is none from the audience doc shy can we proceed to another lecture okay so uh Professor Neri Jalani is recognized again to give his, uh, I guess, uh, he will be asking again. So you're recognized, Professor Neri Jalani. Kindly mm -hmm. unmute your speaker. Uh, one, uh, unmute. Unmute. Ko na. Okay. Uh, just a rejoinder uh, on how to become a good communicator. I think uh, aside from practicing, we should always be ready with our outline. We, we write an outline so that we have a guide in our presentation. So it's so easy and useful way of uh, when we speak before a crowd. So we come up with an outline as uh, presented by Sir Bon Eric. There are only three things that we should prepare. We have an introduction, we have a body, and we have a conclusion. So in the introduction, it's very clear that we, we present our topic in general, then in our text, we give the details, and in the conclusion, we summarize our presentation. So in that way, we are sure that our speaking engagement will smoothly flow and we will not be going out of topic and we will be on the right track. Thank you for this opportunity. Okay, thank you also, Professor Neri, for uh, sharing of ideas regarding uh, what is uh, how to how to communicate properly or uh, to to provide uh, speaking uh, or to to communicate in the class or. Uh, where, uh, wherever you want to communicate, you, you should always be prepared. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Doc, uh, Doc Vaughn, can you please give uh, us a little, uh, any, any message, parting words? My message is simple. But first, before I'm going to tell that message is, again, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So it's nice to meet you all. As per my message is this one. Get out and speak the truth. Just be yourself. And the right audience will always be there to listen to you. Share your stories. Share your experience. Just get out and speak the truth. Stand up for the truth. One last thing. Show the people your heart and your passion. Show the people your heart, and your passion. Thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Von Eric Tandok, for a very wonderful presentation and explanation about good communication and how to communicate properly. So, sir, thank you. Mabuhay po kayo dyan and we hope to also, we can reach you anytime, <clears throat> anytime after this uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Salamat po. <clears throat> okay, so, audience, I think there there is someone who is raising her hand. Uh, may I see first? Where is that? Okay, uh, Professor Dinesh Kumar, are you? Uh, do you want to ask? You're raising your hand. Professor Dinesh Kumar, you are recognized. Okay, I think you just missed to. He uh, just missed to. Uh, So I think that's that would uh, that would end the question of the speaker. Uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah, I have a question uh, to you. Uh, that, uh, uh, sir, please, please. Eric, sir, please. Yes, yes, sir. Kumar, you are recognized, professor. Uh, sir, sir uh, you have told that uh, storytelling is important in. Uh, public speaking. Uh, what type of story uh, about uh, ourselves or uh, other story? Two ways, sir. And you got it right. It can be yourself relating your experience to your topic, to your presentation, or other people's story that inspired you. Okay. And you okay, want okay. to share that inspiration. So both, both can be that. Okay, okay. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Kumar, for your question. And thank you once again, uh, Mr. Von Eric Tandok, for a very nice presentation and explanation about communication. So everyone, let's, uh, let us all remember that communication is the act of giving, receiving, and sharing information. Always remember that good communication, we need to listen carefully, speak, or write clearly when it is in the letter or in the paper, and of course, respect different opinions. So thank you, uh, our expert uh, communicator in the person of Mr. Von Eric Tandok. So now let's proceed with our next uh, presentation or next uh lecturer uh before before we will before we will uh introduce uh before we will uh present her uh may i introduce uh her first okay uh, good afternoon our speaker good for afternoon. this very afternoon. good afternoon Okay, good afternoon, Dr. Shalini. Um, the, our guest speaker or resource person uh, for this afternoon is an assistant professor at the Department of Laws, Himalshal Pradesh University, Shimla, with a teaching experience of 13 years with specialization in business law. Her research papers, articles, conference proceedings in refereed and peer-reviewed national and international journals and chapters in edited book volumes have micro-scale perspective mostly focused on cyber crimes, biopiracy of traditional knowledge, competition policy, IPR issues, biodiversity con conservation and company law she has active uh, participation or she actively participate in national and international seminars workshops colloquium and is frequently invited as a resource person she has done a project on tribal communities 
of Hima Himachal Pradesh in collaboration with Ministry of Tribal Studies, Government of India. She has also organized national moose court and an investor awareness workshop in collaboration with SEBI, Shimla Division. She is Department Coordinator of Cleanliness Drive under Pradhan Mantri Swatch Bharat Mission and Department Coordinator of University Alumni Association. Please help me welcome Dr. Shalini Kashmiria, an Assistant Professor of Law, Department of Laws, Himachal Pradesh University, in Shimla, Himachal Pradesh, India. Uh, ma'am, Doc, uh, you may now start with your presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am, for having me here. First of all, I am very much thankful to Cape Cameron Trust, especially Dr. Shelja Vasudeva, ma'am, uh, International Coordinator. And I am also thankful to Madnao State University, Philippines, for giving me this platform to conversate with you people, not about a topic, but uh, a very major problem that we are facing in our academic writing these days. Let me share my presentation with you and uh, then we'll talk. Is my presentation visible to everybody right now? Yes, Doc, it is visible already. Fantastic, okay. All right. So once again, a warm uh, afternoon to everyone. Uh, and uh, I'm here uh, with the, a topic, not a topic, but a major problem that we are facing at the moment whenever we are doing academic writing, be it any corner of the world. This uh, problem is major these days, and that is plagiarism in academic writing. Uh, what are the reasons for it? Why people commit it? and what we can do at a personal level to avoid it. Be we a student, be we a academician, or be we a writer, in whatever designation we are associated with writing in the higher education system, uh, what, uh, what is the solution for it? What is this concept and what we can do for it? So the very the, the things that I'm going to talk about today with you people are related to the following things. The first one is, the concept of plagiarism by itself and why it is a bad thing why it is considered to be bad in uh, research or in academic writing and what happens to the plagiarist once plagiarism is being committed and a person becomes habitual offender that means he's committing time and again so what happens to them and uh, what are the ways to find plagiarism when we are writing something can we on our personal levels can find out that we are doing deliberately or uh, intentionally or unintentionally we are becoming victim of plagiarism and what steps can be taken at the personal front and what are the penalties if plagiarism is being committed right so i'm switching to my first slide the very first thing is the concept in itself what is plagiarism it has been derived from the latin word plagiare which means to kidnap or to abduct so as we all know it, it is not to be discussed. Kidnapping or abduction is being done without the person's consent, consent and without the person's knowledge. The person is said to be kidnapped or abducted. In the same manner, when we are uh, CCCP, cut, copy and paste, which is very common, when we are taking somebody else's intellect product, what is intellect property? I will discuss later on. So when we are using somebody's else intellectual without the knowledge and without the consent of that person, no matter intentionally done or unintentionally done that we are saying that we didn't knew about it, it is considered to be plagiarism, right? So why it is considered to be uh, plagiarism and why it is considered to be bad? Because it is basically stealing and passing off the ideas that does not belong to you. You are not the originator of those ideas. You are not the creator of that thought. You are not the inventor of a particular formula. You are not the inventor of a particular design. 
so when you are taking it from somebody else who has given a lot of hard time, who has given a lot of time for that particular invention, that particular text, if somebody is writing a book or an article, you are just stealing it from there and you are passing it off. It is considered to be a very bad thing. Secondly, if we talk about it legally, it is considered to be a fraud or a cheating. As I am from India, in India, cheating and fraud have criminal consequences. It is considered to be illegal and the penalties are not only compensation, it can go to imprisonment also, which I will discuss later on. So it is basically doing fraud or cheating with somebody. Right. Now, the question arises, if the person is of your same uh, area or society and he comes to know, well, OK. But if the person is not from your society, he's from some other country and you are taking material from online uh, source and you are just plagiarizing it, what will be the consequences? So I'm sorry, I'm having a bad throat today. So in that case, also, every article or every publication, no matter online or offline, it is always having a copyright form attached to it. <laughs> so whenever we are taking material and we are using that material for our own personal benefit, be it any kind of intellectual property, be it some idea, some invention, some original book of an author, some particular words given by a particular author, like some principles given by a particular uh, scientist or a kind of slogan which is given by a particular uh, person or some geographical design or some proprietary information without the permission or without the knowledge that it belongs to somebody else, it is considered to be intellectual property theft. So what uh, my article is revolving around is avoid CCP. That is cut, copy, and paste. It is bad thing because it has different kind of consequences. Once you do plagiarism, once it comes to the knowledge that uh, this particular material does not belong to you, whatever you are written in your thesis or in your research paper does not belong to you. So what is the consequences of it? The first one is it is a dishonest conduct. It's, it's straight away put uh, an allegation upon you that you are in habit of doing work dishonestly, right? Second is it harms the person who has been plagiarized. The person who has put hard work and has written a particular paper, research paper, or have done a particular research project and given some kind of findings, or have written a particular book, has, has invested a lot of time and money on that. So simply stealing off and passing off that material and crediting it to be your, your own creation is harming uh, the hard work done by that person also, right? It lowers the quality, it lowers the value of the work which he has done because it's pirated copy, copy is available uh, through you. You have also used the same work and you are claiming it to be your work, right? Third is it hinders the learning process. See. Knowledge is not one second game or one day game. Knowledge and uh, being a good researcher or having a good academic skills is a continuous process. It has to be invested slowly and steadily. And once you start in the habit of reading things, only then you can develop your mind, develop the skills to develop the ideas related to it. What you call the research questions on which you write the thesis or you write the articles. So it is a continuous process. So once a person is in habit of learning through cut, copy, paste mode, you are not giving any kind of uh, treatment to your mind to think. So your creative thinking, the ability to think, to develop ideas, so as to do good academic research, it stops. So it is a complete hindrance to the learning process. Third is, next is, it is a bad writing because once you are... Uh, considered to be a dishonest person taking material from somebody else, the substandard work will not attract the readers. And last one in this category is whatever you take through the cut, copy, paste mode, it is a complete mess because you have no clue about what you're writing. You have just seen the topic and you have just started collecting the material from here and there. And now you're trying to make an article, right? 
So let's see now, uh, what are the different areas where plagiarism is committed? What are the various ways by which plagiarism is committed? The first one is making use of the arguments or part of them. If somebody has uh, worked on something and has solved his research problem and given particular evidence and arguments related to it, you are working something related to that, suppose, and you are taking those arguments and you are not obliging that person in your references, then you are simply making using of the arguments given by somebody else because you yourself has not worked hard for those to find out those arguments. So this is the first kind of plagiarism which is being committed. Second is you have hired a ghostwriter. This is very much common these days that you have hired somebody, be it somebody who is working on professional firm, professional front, taking money from you and uh, just publishing your thesis, writing your thesis on a particular topic, or you are just misusing your students for that. That you're asking a student to write an article for you and you're taking the entire credit to your own. That is also considered to be a ghostwriter. Third is copying the text word to word. Now, you don't want to put even a single comma from your, your side or full stop from your side. You just want to copy word from word to another person's work. So this is also a kind of plagiarism. Then the next one is unacknowledged paraphrasing. I will discuss what is paraphrasing later on. But whenever you are writing a passage, taking it from somebody else write up, you have read, suppose you have read an article or you've read a particular page from a book written by some particular author, and now you're writing your own paragraph related to it. But whatever you're writing inside it, that totally matches the idea of the originator, right? So whatever paragraph you are writing, that is based upon the idea which you have taken from a book written by some other person, that is the original author, and you are not even acknowledging that author in your references. That is called as unacknowledged paraphrasing, right? This is a kind of plagiarism which is very much common uh, in the higher education system these days. Then reusing your own work which you have submitted. You have not made any kind of changes. You are just doing multiple publication of the same article which you have written two years back. You have not made further investigations in it. You have not added something to it. Just you have done, you have just shuffled the paragraphs up and down and you are again... Uh, reusing it that is also plagiarism you have to acknowledge yourself if you're writing modifying a particular article written by you uh, two or three years back and you have made some kind of modifications to it for example earlier you did a doctrinal research and now you are switching over to empirical you have find the arguments and you have done you solved the hypothesis and now you are giving your conclusions in that and you, are, you want to put some material which you have written earlier in this article also, then you have to write the references that, that has been taken from your previously published work. And if you are not doing that, this is considered to be plagiarism. <clears throat> Next is uh, making use of the passages or the quotations or the phrases directly or indirectly, which belongs to some other person and without referring to them that who is the originator of it is plagiarism. And the last one in this category is giving incorrect information about the sources. That means the if the reader wants to check which sources you have used, he is not able to go to the actual sources because the source which you are presenting, you have given right now, it is incorrect source, right? Now, the most common kind of plagiarism which is seen these days is the internet plagiarism because it is very convenient with a single click of mouse. You can cut, copy and paste, control P, control C. Have you ever thought that what kind of material you can use from internet sources in your thesis? Is there any authentication of it? Do you go for the digital signature certificates to see whether the material is copyright protected or not? Or you are just taking material from the blogs, from the Wikipedia, or from the personal stories written by a few people who are famous authors, which has got no primary or secondary evidentiary proof of existence, some illusions or fictional things to an extent which is not being proved properly, accepted properly. So whatever material you are downloading without knowledge, without references, 
it is not only substandard but it is also having poor analytical quality so whenever we are using this kind of material in writing our thesis it will always be a question to academic ethics and academic norms right and moreover it has illegal it has legal consequences also because it is illegal use of the written work written work graphic audio video photographs from different websites whether you have checked those websites are authenticated or not whether those websites are approved by the higher education system to be used for academics so that is always a question on the content so if you are making use of this kind of material it is also plagiarism and this is the material which is basically being used these days and has been noticed to be used in uh, thesis in research papers to a great extent by the students uh, see internet is beneficial to an extent that you want to know what is latest happening but if you want to write an entire uh, thesis on this material which is present online that will be a very bad practice it is always preferable to go for the hard copies that means the original work the material which is present offline in the form of books in the libraries which act as repository and sorry and to consult that now the question arises what happens to the plagiarists what kind of crimes they are com they are committing and what kind of crimes are being uh, the crimes are known by which names the first one is infringement of academic ethics and academic norms infringement means violation right second is rephrasing somebody's else ideas leads to theft cheating and fraud third is you cannot check the authentication of the source they cannot check the authentication of the sources they have taken so they cannot convince the audience they will not be able to attract the readers next by writing such kind of crap thesis and submissions which are nothing but to be put in the dustbins uh, they are not they are not uh, contributing as an original contributor right and this is uh, they are not cheating others but in a sense they are cheating themselves only and their fellow students and uh, they don't deserve to be called as supervisors right now whenever uh, we start writing paper and i'm talking so much about plagiarism right now there are certain question that pops up in the mind of every person the first one is if i'm putting the quotations like in humanities in literature in english in hindi or in your local language if there is a subject of local language definitely quotations are there if you're writing if you are discussing about the contributions made by a particular author in linguistics uh, in english so such as for example shakespeare so in that case you need to write about his contributions and if you put his quotations written in different books in dramas in poetry in novels uh, that makes an impact that gives clarity about his thinking process so the very question that arises in our mind is if i quote and paraphrase a lot is my full uh, is my paper full of distracting citations no it doesn't happen like that there are certain subjects as i have mentioned right now in linguistic you need to put quotes provided you give proper references to it there is always a method to put quotations whenever you are using quotations in your thesis in your research articles that should be in the semicolons parentheses should be used and single quotation should not have repetitions time and again you should put quotations then you should write interpret it in your own words taking a conclusion from it and then if that quotation is again repeated after some time you can make use of same as above ibid or you can use id also if it is you have mentioned it in some other page also the same quotation is coming in some other work second question that comes up in a mind is do i need to cite a certain number of sources see how much sources you are using in a particular research paper or thesis that depends upon the justifications that depends upon uh, that depends basically depends upon what is your research problem what you are dealing with 
like in linguistic you put quotations so you have the sources like in law we have lot of sources even we have the footnotes also we give in every page down the page also and we give uh, at the end we give the bibliographies so the amount of sources that are doing justification to your topic that is supporting your argument that can be done but except few kind of subjects too much quoting should be avoided if your uh, thesis is full of quotations only and you have which are just quotations which is you're not giving any interpretations to it and you are not able to support your arguments there then uh, uh, it will not be considered to be an impressive literary writing right so uh, we have to check that also next question is it is it better to just avoid using sources so that i can i don't risk accidental plagiarism as i've told you right now also sources are the backbone of any kind of academic writing see you need to any person sorry any person who has written very famous book till date the idea even if the idea has just popped up in his mind he has gone through what previously has been done on that particular topic so this particular part which we call previously done on that particular topic is basically we know as literature review if a question appears in your mind even like suppose you're using newspaper every day and you come across a problem in this ki, oh this thing is happening in a country right now i need to find about it so it has just popped up in your mind that this is a research question you want to search for now how i will find about it we i have to go through whether some other work has been done whether other authors have said something about it or not so what i am referring to i am referring to the literature review and what i am exactly referring to is referring to the sources the other sources that will help me to develop make my idea stronger that will channelize me to uh, go to, take a direction to which, which which direction i need to take to give justification to this research question on which my hypothesis will be based so avoiding sources can never be an option as far as your academic writing is concerned but of course yes we can take help from certain things like we can use the site generator we can double check the sources we can make use of the plagiarism checker also and whenever we are using quoting and paraphrasing we should do it from the proper sources now the question arises what is paraphrasing i will uh, make it very simple for you people suppose i am reading a book i read four pages and after reading those four pages of course my mind will think about those four pages so when i am thinking about it what i am doing exactly i am memorizing it i am memorizing the idea which is given by that particular author so that memorization now need to be put down in the form of points or what you call notes in any diary your favorite diary or your page whatever you keep with yourself because once it is put down in the form of the points you will remember it for a longer duration and if you think you are uh, you are a sentence scorer and everything will be like computer uh, in your central processing unit everything will be inside your mind for uh, a longer duration without writing it down then i'm sorry it doesn't work for human brain so you point out those points now now those points which you have pointed out then you read some other author you read two three authors on the same kind of book and now you have taken the notes now you are in a position to develop your own ideas because now you have discussed three four books related to it now when you are putting that particular thing in your uh, uh, your ideas your information inside a particular write up which you are writing right now what you are doing exactly definitely yes whatever you have written in the form of notes that will be included in your uh, write up along with that if you are writing three lines from a particular author make it a habit to cite the source of the information in references cite it correctly first of all and after three lines 10 lines should be your original contribution right then it is this is considered to be paraphrasing this is the definition of paraphrasing in right sense right so what paraphrasing is to take three lines from somebody and writing 10 lines of your own in support of those ideas right so and the three lines that you have taken from somebody you should give proper reference of it and secondly just don't swap the words in between like you have taken uh, you have not made the notes you have read a book now you like a particular paragraph from an author 
now you're writing that uh, paragraph and what you are doing you are just uh, moving the words here and there and you have made no no contribution to it you're just swapping the words here and there and you're trying to portray that this is your original work now the different kinds of plagiarism the first one is global second is verbatim third is paraphrasing plagiarism fourth is patchwork and last is self plagiarism except the global plagiarism the maximum cases that has been reported right starting from verbatim to self plagiarism they are either uh, done deliberately or indeliberately they can be also done in accidentally the researcher is not knowing that they are doing the plagiarism but as far as the global plagiarism is concerned it is always done intentionally that is plagiarizing the entire text you have not made even a single change and you are deliberately using ccp method to write a particular article or a particular page chapter in a thesis and you are not obliging the originator of that particular uh, idea or that particular text right so what is the solution for it the solution is very simple read do a lot of reading and try to develop your own essays or articles second is verbatim verbatim refers to the words now you want you have taken words you like some particular word used by some author and you have taken that word which is quite famous among the community and you are trying to put it in your article and you are just trying to portray that that word word belongs to you because you're not giving reference from where that you have taken that word right so there are many examples of verbatim first is yeah of or i have told you earlier you have taken a text from it you have just shuffled the words inside it but still if you read it somebody can make it out that it is completely identical to some other author's work or you have slightly altered it or maximum uh, words in your passage belongs to somebody else so this is verbatim plagiarism and the solution is very simple if you take some very famous word from somebody give reference to it and in reference can be given in many ways it can be given in references also it can be done in the form of in text citations which can be in the front or at the back writing the name of the author and the year as well right next is paraphrasing plagiarism we have already discussed it i will not waste my time again discussing the same thing i have told you if you take three lines just remember it from somebody write 10 lines of your own right next is patchwork plagiarism this is a very simple one done among the students five articles selected online taking one paragraph from each article making your own article that is called as patchwork making a whole kiosk of the article where is the research question nobody knows what you were up to nobody knows totally unstructured write up messed up article you have submitted without citing the source correctly self plagiarism this we also have discussed earlier already published work will i'll just go to the examples of it resubmitting an entire paper multiple publications of the same paper second copying and paraphrasing passages from the previous work third recycling the previously collected data this is very important you have already done empirical study suppose you are working on uh, mm, you are working on education system in suppose i take some example from himachal pradesh uh, i am at in the city capital shimla so i have done uh, some research on orphanage in uh, district shimla orphan orphanage in district shimla i collected the data and i have given the result this is what is happening in shimla and this is the law now what i am doing i am using uh, again i am extending it to some other district of other part of the same state so am i contributing something nothing the same data the same technique and same thing is being used there also tata tools will remain the same i have added nothing to it right i have just picked up firstly i picked up shimla and now i'm picking up some other district of uh, himachal pradesh only state himachal pradesh and i am not uh, i'm using my previously collected data inside it and i am not contributing even if i have taken some other district i am not going there same that data is used by me now i am representing it to be of some other district and i am giving the same result so this is plagiarism uh, next one is uh, even if i have given some principle earlier and i have not added something to it something added to because whenever we write a thesis at the end of the thesis it is mandatory as far as uh, in india is concerned what is the dimensions the further areas which can be uh, researched uh, related to your phd thesis so 
uh, if uh, I have not contributed to that, if I'm going from extensive to intensive, after intensive study, again, we go for extensive. What is the area we have left on which further research can be carried out? So that is not considered to be a good uh, academic writing, right? Next is now there are different kinds of citing methods which are available online also. And uh, you can take it from your universities also, APA, MLA, Chicago, ILI styles. You should follow them. This is very much important whenever you do an academic writing because that can be an internal, uh, uh, completely entire uh, different presentation uh, for how um, on the writing formats. But whatever suits you, you can use that for your writing your uh, uh, sources so that you can give a proper authentication to your sources. So I have just discussed APA because APA method is very much common. You write the author's initials first, then his name, then the year, then the title of the book or the thesis or the dissertation, then the university name, URL number or DOI number. And if you're using in-text citations, then I have told you author's uh, surname can be used and the year. Okay. Now, what are the reasons for plagiarism? Why we are committing it? The very first one is the competition to succeed that we APIs, because in universities also, uh, there is two, two kinds of ways by which we can get promotions, career advancement schemes and the uh, direct recruitment. So there is a competition. Or public article publication. I have seen of uh, academicians publishing 10, 10 papers in a year. I don't know how much, how they develop so much ideas within an year to publish so much, you know. And second is workload pressure also that they have to complete the task which they have undertaken. So the easiest way they find find is to cut, copy and paste. And the third very important part is shallow knowledge of academic writing. People don't have the knowledge that directly or indirectly they are committing plagiarism and uh, they commit it uh, and uh, how to write a good research paper. They don't know about it. And the last one is it is very easy. You don't have to work hard for it. And there are certain things which you must know when you write a paper so as to avoid plagiarism, which makes your paper effective and notes are given at the end of the paper, which gives additional information about the cited source. The references gives about the author, something basically used for the thesis, author and year, but end notes gives a complete picture of it. Footnotes are basically used in legal uh, studies. We give footnotes of every paragraph we are writing uh, below the paper page only. Then we have the copyright knowledge. It is very much important. And I, I, I am quite uh, sure about this, that except the law uh, researchers, very few people know about it. From wherever you're taking the material, be aware about the, the legal consequences also. So copyright infringement is the biggest problem right now. That is straight away related to your intellectual property rights. Then we have the in-text references we should give and bibliographies uh, should be given. And uh, literature review importance, I have already told you that literature review should be done if you want to avoid plagiarism. We should be in the habit of reading a lot because ideas will develop only when we will read a lot lot of reading is being done by us. So when we do uh, reading, what happens? How we can avoid plagiarism? The very first thing is, whenever you read something, I've told you make notes of it. Now you get different kinds of notes when you read. The notes, which are in the form of quotation, use some marks for it. You know, you can use sticky notes for it. Use some sketch pens for it. Use some words for it. Like if you have taken some code, put Q there or put some red pen there. This is a quotation. Right. If it is uh, after reading few things, something you have written in your notes, which belongs to you, write me there. That is me. When you are starting to write a thesis, you take notes first. So write me there. Use green pen for it or use something else. If you are taking a proper word or slogan from somebody, write W there or S there. So in this way, you should take the notes properly, demarcating the different things. You can divide your diary into three parts also. I used to do it like this when I did my PhD. And I used to write these are the quotations. These are the... Uh, paraphrasing I will do. This is the words I am going to use. So in this way, we can do it. And before writing the thesis also, if you want to avoid a plagiarism, you are writing an article, make a synoptic view, make a chart of it, exactly what you want to do inside it. Because I have seen students writing without thinking what they have to do. This is an example I have given you. Uh, suppose I want to write a research paper on cyber crimes in higher education system. So obviously, I will make a synoptic view of it that I have to discuss the definition. Then I have to try to talk about the statistics, then the kinds of cyber crime. Then I have to what is it, its impact, personal and professional. And then what are the laws dealing with it, global as well as domestic? So this kind of chart will come into your mind when you will do literature review, first of all. And then you have to cite the sources. These sources can be quotations. These sources can be your uh, uh, own ideas. Also, these sources can be your words or slogans, whatever you are using. 
now how to put quotations i'll go uh, here um, Quoting is must. Quoting is must when you are focusing on a language. Like I've told you in linguistic, I've given you an example of Shakespeare here. If you're writing in linguistic, here quotations are to be put. Secondly, quoting is must when you are giving evidence. Evidence like suppose if I am uh, writing on uh, uh, a thesis on drafting of Indian constitution or constitution of India. So here, obviously, yes, I will be writing about the thoughts given by the philosophers and the leaders at that time. So definitely, yes, I will have quotations here because I have to give evidence that they thought like that. That's why they have given this law. And then uh, when I have to prove uh, author's position or definition, for example, I am uh, I'm working on some principle of law or principle of uh, gravity. So here, if I am talking about principle of gravity and I'm taking, I'm putting up a scientific test and I'm taking out the conclusion, definitely, yes, it should be in accordance with the hypothesis I've made. So here to prove a particular theory, I have to definitely, yes, I have to put some principles given by a particular author. Paraphrasing, I have actually, there's so many slides here, but I will I will just take which you can understand. The simple tricks when quoting directly. Directly means now word to word, you want to take the quotation, what you have to do. Firstly, you keep the author's name close to the notes. When you are collecting the notes related to quoting, author's name should be written there and the year in text citations I'm talking about so that you can remember from where you have taken it. Secondly, you should refer it in your references also. You should give credit to that author for that, right? Third is, you should mention the name. In-text citations of quotations is very much important. You should mention the name uh, within your research paper or uh, your thesis, either in front or in the middle or at the end, right? Then you should put it inside the semicolons and you should, if you are omitting something, you should use ellipses for it and you should put it inside the brackets. Right? And you should ensure that you note exact page number in the references. And now when we are quoting it directly, indirectly means now we are paraphrasing. I have told you, if you're writing three lines, 10 lines should be your own. Keep the name of the clo author close to the notes when you are taking the notes and you have to write now. You haven't written anything as yet. And you should give the references and you should double check the originator source as well. So the simple trick for writing uh, in your own language, how we can write, first of all, you should read, you should summarize, you should memorize. And then at the time of writing, you should oblige. Read, summarize, memorize, and oblige in the form of references. For example, uh, like if you like some unique phrase or a quotation, you, you are writing something that belongs to Austin or belongs to Shakespeare, then according to Shakespeare. And then you give your footnote, uh, we give footnote, you give your references and you write about from Shakespeare author, which book, where he has written in your references. And if you're writing about some particular uh, word you're using, for example, I'm talking here about Hens Kelsen, 1872, pigeonhole theory, you put it inside the quotes. And what he has said, you should write about it and you should give it in the references also. So the, this trick can you can use Q for quotations, S for sources and me for the write up when you take the notes. So this is an example of uh, APA styling. I will skip it. Uh, this is the most important, the last part of it. What are the legal consequences of it, right? So in India, we have so many legal consequences right now. We are focusing a lot upon academic writings and we are, the University Grant Commission is also very much strict regarding it. So we have definitely, uh, we are definitely dealing with it and we have, we consider it to be violation of our copyright laws, the right to copy. Whenever somebody writes something, they give a right to the publishing house to copy it. But the original original work remains with the author only. That's why you see the reprinted edition by the same author. You see the re-editions by the same author. So uh, if you are copying somebody's material, no matter from a publisher or from the original text, and you are not referring to it, then it is considered to be copyright infringement, right? No matter intentionally or unintentionally, right? So in that case, if you are copying the both, the publishing house as well as the original author can sue you. So where is the punishment given under the Indian legal system? Section 57 along with section 63 is talking about copyright infringement and the penalties have been provided under section 63 and 63A. 
If somebody has copied somebody else's material, cut, copy, and paste, there will be imprisonment of six months and fine up to uh, that can extend to three years, depending upon the loss caused to the original author or the publishing house. And there will be a penalty of 50,000 rupees that can go up to two lakh rupees also. And if he turns out to be habitual offender under Section 63A, that he wants to commit it time and again, he is doing the same thing, then this penalty will increase, right? So we have all the civil and the criminal uh, consequences of it. There will be injunctions to restrain further infringement, right? You will be stopped from doing it. Then uh, there will be, you have to pay the damages also. And uh, you will not be able to uh, use those copied uh, work which you have done. So now the next thing is uh, our judicial system is also playing an important role. And since 2015, which was the landmark case of Roche versus Sipla, uh, penalties have been imposed. So I will just come to what are the guidelines given by the UGC. University Grant Commission is the national body which is regulating the higher education system in India at the moment. Uh, I'm quite sure in Philippines also you will must have some educational body which is regulating your higher education system. So here uh, our guidelines have been uh, in 2018, they have been amended. And now 10% of the similarity is permissible in academic writing. But and uh, they are approving a software tool which is universally applicable throughout the country to check the plagiarism before the submission by the student. And once the submission is done by the student, the supervisor is responsible to issue the certificate that the research work which is done under him, it is uh, it is free from plagiarism. And then the soft copies or the thesis which are submitted, they will be submitted to Infibinet. Uh, by the higher education system itself, we submit it in our, the university um, um, ed, uh, academic branches and they send it to Infibimate and they, then they upload it on the Shod Ganga also, that the work on this particular work has been done now. Okay, so these are the penalties on the supervisors and the, for uh, committing plagiarism if they issue wrong certificates. If it is a minor penalty up to 10%, it is not, uh, no penalty is there. And this minor penalty includes the primary sources. Like we cannot change the bibliography word. We cannot change the law statute sections. We cannot change we, the name of the act. We cannot change. We cannot put words inside it. If some principle we are putting, we cannot change that. So these kind of minor things, they are up to 10% plagiarism is permissible. But if it is from 10 to 40%, then the manuscript will be withdrawn. And uh, if it is uh, from 40 to 60%, level two penalties, not only the manuscript or the thesis which is submitted, it is withdrawn, but the supervisor will be denied annual increment and he will not be able to supervise any master's degree, MPhil and PhD student for two years. And if the penalty is beyond 60%, aapka level, uh, your level is beyond 60%, uh, plagiarism is beyond 60%, above then the manuscript is withdrawn. Uh, one annual increment is also denied and uh, the supervisor will not be able to uh, supervise master PhD students for a period of three years. So uh, this is all about our, uh, my lecture at the moment. And uh, I hope uh, uh, I am able to give you some kind of clarity related to plagiarism because uh, uh, I think uh, this is the most important uh, thing we are facing at the moment. Thank you so much once again, Cape Cameron Trust and uh, Menedanao State University, Philippines, for having me there. Uh, and if you have any kind of queries, you are open to ask me any questions. Feel free to ask me anything you feel like. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Shailini Kashmiria, for a very nice presentation. It was actually a great time listening to your presentation and we have learned that plagiarizing another's work eliminates one's credibility as a researcher and can have significant and negative ramifications to one's reputation and career as a researcher. So therefore, we must not plagiarize. So thank you, Dr. Shalini. Thank um, you, Mike. Okay, may I ask from the audience or participants uh, to give their or to ask uh, a question to our dear uh, presenter? Uh, Dr. Professor Kumar, you are raising your hand. Yes, madam. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, very interesting and very informative lecture, madam. Thanks. Uh, I, yes, 
I have a question, little question. Uh, yeah. uh, say something about plagiarism softwares, madam. Softwares. Okay. Okay, plagiarism software. Uh, see, uh, as such, uh, it is a tendency that there are some private softwares which are also available in the market. I'm talking in Indian context because you're from India. And uh, students are in habit of uh, taking the reports from there and submitting to the supervisor. But uh, according to the UGC Grant Commission at the moment, uh, we are using Orkund. Orkund is available in every university and even the private universities are also instructed to use Urkund, which is uh, recommended by our higher education system. And it is available in all the government institutions in India at the moment. And uh, it, the, the passwords have been given to the supervisors and it becomes the utmost duty of the supervisors to check your thesis on Urkund first chapter by chapter and then uh, to give the report. So as such, we have many, so many softwares, but uh, the most authenticated, which has to be submitted, the certificate has to be withdrawn from Urkund only. So you go with Urkund. If you are doing your work, go with Urkund that is available with your supervisor and all the professors. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? You're recognized, sir, Professor Neri Jelani from MSU Sulu. Kindly unmute your, your mic, sir. Okay. Uh, Salamu alaikum to our uh, distinguished lecturer, Madam. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Uh, I would just like to ask if, is it, is it advisable that we have to use um, plagiarism detector and checker? Okay. Yes, sir. It is not advisable. It is mandatory these days because you have uh, civil and criminal consequences for it. It is not advisable. Uh, what is the okay, okay. Continue, please. Because uh, uh, we these days, uh, there is a trend of uh, doing online publications. And uh, people are publishing their articles online uh, in different journals who are privatizing and who are using publication for the purpose of uh, just earning money. There are so many publishing houses these days. So uh, keeping yourself safe because uh, just in case if somebody finds out that you are using somebody else's material can put you in legal consequences, it is always mandatory that you should uh, avoid plagiarism. So, um, what would you suggest the best way that we can avoid plagiarism in our writings? So, as I've told you, paraphrasing should be done properly. Usually, I've seen students not understanding what is paraphrasing exactly. They read something and they copy it and they just write it. Developing your own ideas after reading something is the most important thing in academic writings. Developing your own ideas, that will depend upon how much reading you do before uh, taking up a research problem. Or before, it will not only help you in writing good, but it will also help you in giving clarity about what exactly you are going to do in your thesis or dissertation. Excuse what me, Shamani, ma'am. Excuse yes? me. Your yes. uh, screen is showing a blank. Wait. My screen is showing blank, but. Uh... Hello, ma'am. Ma'am. Can I ask some more? Follow am I up, audible up. to everybody? Am I audible to everyone or not? Yes, ma'am, you're audible, but it's not uh, flashing. Or I don't know. Yes, it's wrong with it. I think uh, I have my video is on, but uh, I don't know. But anyways, I can answer your questions. Doesn't matter. You can ask me anything you feel like. Feel free to ask. I'll try that I will be visible, but uh, you can ask me anything you feel like. Please feel free. I hope I am clear now. I am. Uh, you can see me. Hello, hello, ma'am. 
yes sir uh, yes yes madam you are clear you are you are okay clear. okay okay so you can proceed what do you want to ask uh with with paraphrasing how do we go about paraphrasing do we have to completely write the whole the whole uh, idea or should we just change a few words so or... we yes this is a very good question sir paraphrasing means uh, you have read some suppose you have read a story of 10 pages now you want to uh, write your own idea you have some memory of it you want to add something you have to add something of your own in into it so that you should be considered as an originator of something which you have read earlier but you have added something to it for example if you have read something if you are taking three lines from there add your 10 of your own i getting my point like three lines you have read a book you uh, summary is there in your mind but you think that you can do something else with it also because every mind works differently you know you read something on uh, women empowerment and there are certain conclusions given to it but you think that these can also be there because in my country things are not like this in my country these steps to be taken because in my country women are like this okay so when you are adding something contributing from your side to it after reading something that is called as paraphrasing <laughs> okay thank you very much madam welcome. most welcome most welcome anyone else uh, another participant uh dr ujaini sinha roy you recognize madam yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, first of all uh, dr shalini it was wonderful to listen to your presentation thank you so much it was very informative but one thing i wanted to ask madam me yeah. being a student of english literature and uh, teaching english language also now um, when i am writing a paper what then inadvertently mm -hmm. is there any uh, technical support other than the paid apps that we have which could like you know uh, be a pointer that these might be uh, sounding or uh, seeming like plagiarism ma'am we can use plagiarism checkers are available there but as such higher education system has not recognized them but uh, in right. linguistic yes that that's quite true Uh, UGC Grand Commission is not recognizing any plagiarism checker at the moment. We can always go with the, uh, uh, we can check the sources, double check or uh, check thrice the sources you are taking. For you from linguistic background, I think uh, it is advisable only to go with the hard copies because in your quotations will be so much uh, because uh, that is a subject. Uh, you will be quoting so much from the authors because usually you work on their dramas and novels and poetries. so there will be yes. so much material will be taken from the what author said and why he said this and what were the circumstances that in, influenced him to say like this so the yes, best thing to avoid plagiarism is to give reference of it make use of semicolons make use of uh, ellipses make use of brackets and uh, make use of in text citations or use according to xyz and give proper references proper references in the uh, reference that is very much important for you and secondly go with the hard copies because uh, as far as linguistic is concerned i don't think so uh, online material is uh, of that much value thank you ma'am welcome welcome okay thank you uh, dr ujaini sinha roy for the question so some more from the um uh, from the audience on site and online you can uh give your question to our dear uh expert in plagiarism uh dr shalini okay uh Professor Neri Jalani, uh, would you like to add some more question? Um, I would just like to inquire if, in case that we write our thesis, is it uh, is it advisable that every idea that we get from uh, research 
so that we can avoid being uh, charged of plagiarism, I would say that we need to cite our sources exactly. all the time. Exactly. So uh, I've told you the three lines which you will write that will have the references and the 10 lines which you will write will not have the references. So if your thesis is like, like every paragraph is referred to, that means you are not contributing anything from your side. You know? So you write, take some lines, write reference for it and then write your own write up also in your own language, using your own words, reflecting your original idea in that. And that will come when you will do an honest study, be it doctrinal or be it empirical, then you will be able to, because when we do empirical studies with that, like, for example, we collect data. So that data belongs to you. Now, when you will take out the conclusions of that, you cannot give references to of anything because that is your brainchild. You have worked on that. And when you will give suggestions related to it, that is also your brainchild. You will not be able to give references for that because that is your brainchild. So in this way, you can do it very easily. So you can work for that easily. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think uh, it seems that the uh, your presentation, madam, Dr. Shalini, is very interesting. Uh, there is another, uh, there is one more, I think, question from Dr. Ujaini Sinha Roy. Doc, you are recognized. Dr. Ujaini, you you are recognized. Okay, so I think she just missed to uh, click. I'm the... so sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. I have already asked okay. my question. Okay, okay. So now I think uh, there's nothing more to add with the presentation of Dr. Shalini. So we can conclude her uh, presentation that avoiding plagiarism is paramount as a writer because it comprise it compromises your integrity. Exactly. So why we should? Yeah. Why we should not pl plagiarize? First, it is unethical because it is a form of theft by taking the ideas and words of others and pretending that they are our own even if it's not. You are stealing someone else intellectual property. So if possible, we have to avoid plagiarism. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Shalini. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Vaughn earlier, who provided us also another lecture in communication. And I think, Dr. Shalini, that would be the end. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Once Please again, I'm thankful to Cape Cameroon Trust and to the university for having me here. I hope That's I'm good. able to contribute myself to some extent to uh, help you to read more. Please read more. Read from good stuff. Google cannot be an answer for everything. Read good write-ups. There is a hell lot of uh, writing done by people who have worked really hard. So do that before uh, writing anything of your own. Thank you so much.